Okay, I, I think we should start this uh, uh, session. So welcome everybody to uh, today last afternoon session. Uh, please come the remaining guys who are staying outside. And let me introduce uh, our keynote speaker of the session, uh, Dr. Uh, Duong, who will present his lecture on uh, vasculature of the eye. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank Mark Hickey and the organizer for putting this uh, very, very nice program together. Very interesting. Going to all the talks so far, and um, um, so particularly inviting me, uh, Mark. So. Um, so there will be a little bit switching to, the, um, to, the, to discuss about the eye uh, in this uh, session. Um, just briefly to review, as you can see, the um, blood flow that supplies the eye comes from uh, that branch of the artery, uh, the internal carotid artery, ICA. And you can see that there's two major sets of vessels. One is the central artery, central ophthalmic artery. And then there's another set of vessels that supplies on this side. The central artery comes from, uh, uh, supplies the inner part of the retina. You can see the vessels here. And whereas uh, those that are on the side supply the choroid, which is in the back of the eye. And in between here, there's no vessels or a vascular region. The drainage is pretty much the same. That is returning from this side out to the, uh, through the optic nerve and also out uh, back to the eye. And also there's extra thing called vortex vein here that drains blood flow. Um, the retinal vessels and the choroid vessels are shown on the right uh, on this slide. So you can see that uh, as the vessel comes in, the central retinal artery branch in, and it radially branch off and return, central retinal vein return. Um, this is looking at the surface as you look at the person's eye uh, in the optic nerve head area. Um, that's the front of the eye. And the back of the eye, which you normally not easily observable because the uh, RPE and other things are blocking the, the, the view, uh, but what you can see actually if you do a casting, this is a casting by the way, is that in the choroid vessel in the back, there are big arteries like pipes. And then there's vertical vessels that kind of go up here and branch off this very nice network of capillary, so-called choreal capillaries. So very nice network, single layer, very unique. I'm not quite sure there's anything like it in, the, in, in, in other part of the body. Um, so just to summarize briefly what I just discussed is that there's a set of retinal Vessel, light comes in here, the vitreous is here, the lens is up uh, top here, the back of the eye is here, the core vessel, the pipes are down here. You can see the core capillaries here, and the retinal vessel on top, and also project some capillary and arterial down into the inner layer of the retina. And then there's a region here that's a vascular that includes the photoreceptor and the, sec the, the photoreceptor segments. Um, it's approximately 20 to 50 micron thick, this whole thing. In rats and in humans, approximately 700 microns, so it's not very thick. Um, and it's a challenge for MRI, which I'll discuss later. Uh, I'll focus more on the blood flow because that's this, uh, all the vasculature of the eye. Um, um, the choroid blood flow is very high. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail and um, compared to retinal uh, blood flow. And they are modulated differently by uh, both in terms of autoregulation and in terms of how they're affected by diseases. Uh, just to insert here is a 3D MRI, one slide of 3D MRI. If you have all the time in the world and do an ex vivo MRI, you can actually get the resolution very similar in contrast, very similar to histology. So. Uh, what are the major uh, eye diseases associated with uh, potential um, damage to the vessels? Uh, one is um, diabetic neuropathy, which is a complication of diabetes. And what you see is in, in the late stage, this is the effect. That is, you, uh, there are spots in your, eye, uh, in your field of view, and that's because of neovascularizations, and, and, and you can see right here, uh, bleeding in the retina. Uh, another one is glaucoma, uh, very prevalent as well. Uh, glaucoma is uh, one form of glaucoma. The major form of glaucoma is that um, there is an increase in, in intraocular pressure. And consequently, as you can see, the, the eye is a solid uh, 
piece of uh, organ, and the optic nerve is everything exit. And you can imagine that in that exit, there's vessels and optic uh, axons, etc. So if you have increased pressure, intraocular pressure, you can compress those axons as well as blood vessel, causing ischemia, causing degeneration of the optic nerve. Uh, head. You can see right there in the late stage of uh, glaucoma here. The, the visual effect or the, the symptom is that normal visions like this, at extreme glaucoma, you basically lose peripheral visions. Uh, you also have something called artery, arteries or vein occlusion, where there's a major occlusion in this set of vessels here. And this is the uh, fluorescent angi angi angiography, where um, if there's normal flow on top, you can see the enhancement by the fluorescein, whereas those that have no flow are not enhanced. So the goal of our laboratory over the past uh, few years are to develop uh, MRI techniques to uh, investigate, the, investigate the retina, particularly anatomical physiology like blood flow and oxygenation, as well as function. And the goal of our lab is to use high field, high performance gradients, RF detectors, uh, improving MRI protocols and animal preparations and image processing to achieve this goal. And I would like to thank Camille and, and Mark and Rick introduce all the major techniques that I'll be talking about so I can save some time there. Most of my talk will be on animal models. Uh, will be some application toward the end in human. So just to put things in perspective, uh, this is the typical human brain images. Approximately 16 centimeter field of view, 18 centimeter field of view. The size that we're dealing with, or width I'm dealing with here, is approximately 0.6 centimeters. So you can imagine the resolution you need to achieve um, multiple layers in the retina. So the challenge, again, is uh, spatial temporal resolution and also eye movement in both animal model and in human. So uh, this is one of the first few images that we acquired a while back in a cat. Um, what you see here is um, the cornea, which is, uh, um, sorry, this is the anterior chamber, the lens, the bitches. And here's the retina in the back here, and cellular body, uh, et cetera. So the zoom in region here, you can see multiple layers. Um, one bright, dark bright, and then the sclera in the back, which is dark because there's not much water in there. Uh, here's another high resolution. You can see the uh, resolution. This is on the order of 50 by 50 microns on a T2, T1 weighted image. Um, similar to the uh, brain, where you have but uh, brain barrier, there's also a but retinal barrier. Uh, so contrast agents such as gallium, DTPA, myon, et cetera, cannot penetrate the but retinal barrier, uh, nor the RPE. So you have a very nice way to enhance the two vasculature on both sides of the retina, um, as is shown here. So before contrast, after contrast, subtraction. If you zoom in, you can see the retinal vasculature on the surface of the eye. Uh, this is, of course, a sagittal uh, cut. Um, and the Choroid in the back, um, and the avascular region in between. So this is very, our very first attempt in the in, in, in early 2006 or so. Uh, we have also reproduced it with a on a rat where we can actually do more because there's more disease model we can utilize. And basically, the image shown on the uh, bottom here shows a coil. Uh, this is a small eye coil to make just fit the rat eye. You can see it's very tiny, approximately uh, less than one centimeter. In diameter. Uh, there's also a labeling coil here for, for both rat and uh, mice, where basically what we use this for is for arterial spin labeling, uh, particularly for mice. Um, <clears throat> same thing, if you put galenium before and after, you can see the enhancement in the retinal vessels, the choroid vessels, and the vascular region in between. Uh, you can also, of course, enhance with galenium the extraocular structure, of course. And uh, we've shown this previously that this is uh, the major, the, the three band, if you will, bright, dark, bright, bright, dark, bright. So retinal vessel on the top, a vascular region between, and choroid vessel toward the bottom uh, correspond to this three layer bright, bright dark, and bright. So uh, here's a high resolution image, so I'm going progressively, uh, better image quality, I think. Um, where we use myon, um, and again, this is a high resolution where it's 40 micron by 40 micron, you can see much better the retinal vessels uh, layers, the core vessel lay in the back, and the vascular in between. Uh, you can also see a ciliary body here that's enhanced because that's also very leaky. Um, so the next set of uh, images I want to show is that, um, it's not moving. 
So that was, that's okay. The main piece, this is a 3D 18 by 18 by 18 micron. So this is animal is actually paralyzed, and that's size. And you can see that the, the lens is around there. Um, go through the different layer. I'll flatten it, you'll see that better. The top row is green echo, and bottom row is spin echo. No particular um, thing. So let me see if I can go back and show that again. Uh, so satchel view cutting through where you can see the eyes start showing up. Um, lens here, the pictures here. And you can see the vasculature by the delta two, uh, R2 star images or delta R2 images over there. Um, so it's a 3D data set. You can go back and, and look at the other view. And this is a view where we already flattened. So now you're looking at the eye uh, head on. So uh, in the middle somewhere, you'll see if it's merged, is the, um, is the, there you go. So that's the radial structure of the retinal vessels. Um, I'm going to go back again to show you that again. So um, as you go in, you can see a little more enhancement, if you will, and suddenly the retinal vessel shows up. And uh, you can do 3D rendering. You can see um, this is anatomy up to my, before myon and up to myon. Uh, you can see the vascular the eye at about uh, 18 isotropic uh, micron resolution. Uh, here's the summary of the slide in a static frame where you can see a little better. So as you go from the back of the eye here toward the front of the eye where the vitreous are, uh, the optic nerve head here, and you can see the optic nerve coming up, the posterior ciliary arteries showing up here, and you can see the inferior branch of the posterior ciliary artery. And as you move toward the front, uh, each slide again is about 18 micron. Um, this is the, the one, the one left and right is the long posterior ciliary artery and the inferior branch. And as you move closer here, you start to see the choroid, okay? And the choroid is pretty messy, if you remember, it's all sort of pipe in the back and then there's something that sticks up and then there's choroid capillaris. We think that on, that on the order around here, uh, the choroid capillaris, where you become, uh, we, we don't, you no longer see the uh, contrast in terms of vascular lines anymore. Uh, here are still the big pipes in the bottom of the uh, uh, eye. But as you move closer to here, you start seeing the choroid capillaris and it's uh, enhanced relative to the background. And as you go to a stage somewhere around here, between here and here is the avascular region where there is no vessels, it's avascular. And that's the full receptors and the full receptor segments. That's approximately 100 micron thick. Um, so there's some partial volume effect here and the flattening effect. So it's not very, it's not completely clear. There's no signal, in other words. Uh, but as you go up here, you can see that the, the, the central artery start to show up and it start branching out radially. Um, and you can see the difference between retinal artery and vein uh, because of uh, delta uh, because of the effects from the oxy and the oxymoglobin that Camille and Rick uh, has uh, spoke, uh, already spoke to you about. Um, here's some more comparison with casting. The long posterior ciliary arteries, left and, right, left and right, you can see right there, and inferior branch, inferior branch. Uh, same here with uh, in the surface of the retina, which is the retinal arteries and vein. Uh, there is also a possibility of doing uh, contrast where you have the animal breathe 100% oxygen or carbogen um, versus air. So if you look at under air condition, you see very nice um, arteries and vein, artery and vein, artery and veins. When you give 100% oxygen, uh, what happens is the contrast reduce, and the reason for that is that there's vasoconstriction, very strong vasoconstriction. Um, and as well as increasing oxygenation. So effectively, two things comes in play. And this is very different from the brain. The brain, if you have a person breathe 100% oxygen, blood flow decreased on the order of 10, 13%. That was a very old days work by using PET. Um, and that's been also been reduced by MRI. But in the retina, basal constriction and decrease in blood flow are on the order of 60%. So the, the retina is actually quite special in many ways in this in this retinal vessels as well as its, its uh, choroidal vessels. So just to, to repeat it again, that that you can see the basal constriction because there's a decrease in signal enhancement relative to air, for example. Just, right. 
And then also the, the, the vein also disappear because there are increased oxygenation. So the vein is less vasoconstrictive compared to the artery in response to pure oxygen breathing. So there are some contrasts you can play with. I think that's the long and short of it. Uh, with the 5% addition of CO2, you have vasodilation. So that count the effect of the vasoconstriction by uh, a pure oxygen. There's still 95% oxygen. So basically 5% CO2 literally overwrite the effects of vasoconstriction due to oxygen breathing. So that's the vascular of the eye. Um, the next things that we've been doing uh, has been trying to use arterial spin labeling, measurement of blood flow. And I'll show you a couple of the data we have uh, and with applications to diabetic retinopathy in the rat model, glaucoma in the rat, a mouse model, and retinal degeneration if I have time. Um, so this is um, a anesthetized rat where you put an MRI uh, at uh, 12 Tesla, actually to be exactly 11.7 Tesla, um, where you can acquire on the order of uh, 42 by 42 micron with a slide thickness on the order of one millimeter. Um, you can see right here the, the uh, tagging uh, when the animal's alive, the air signal give you blood flow here and some uh, contrast also here. And those are the profile where if you cut the profile across here, so this is the side of the vitreous, this is the side of the sclera, so this is the quarry blood flow peak and the retinal blood flow peak, and in between is the vascular region with photoreceptors and the photoreceptor segments, so there's no blood flow there. If you euthanize the animal in the magnet, you make the measurement before and after, there's basically noise That's to demonstrate that all the signal is com com comes from blood flow uh, and not artifacts such as empty effects, among others, subtraction artifacts. We verified it and validated it with uh, microspheres. This is very, because this is one of the first measurements, so we make sure that's right. And this experiment is quite complicated, very labor intensive, but we actually finally did it with a, a few animals. And the long and short of it is that you can actually take uh, two different color microsphere where you inject it. It's very standard um, approach in the old days. And you can extract the retinal vessel, just peel it off, and, and then extract the core vessels. And you count the, count the fluorescence. I'm not sure you can see here, but there is actually fluorescence here. And the ratio between core and retinal blood flow is about 7 to 1. And that's quite consistent with this ratio of 9 to about 1 point something. Okay, so um, I, um, there are other things that we did that uh, I won't go into, like, for example, light versus dark adaptation, light versus dark ad adaptation and visual stimuli, um, et cetera. But I want to say something about diabetic retinopathy. Um, is a disease, is a metabolic disease in origin uh, when a person has diabetes, but there's also quite a bit of vascular component to it, and particularly the eye is predominantly vascular disease. Um, so you, you remember uh, previously where, where the initial phase of, of uh, diabetic retinopathy is that you have mild hypoxia, and, and for whatever reason, it triggers, uh, because of hypoxic, uh, hypoxia, it triggers uh, angiogenesis and neovascularization, and at the end, the neovascularization of the eye is actually causing us causing the patient to lose vision. So we, we, one of the hypotheses from our project is to see, uh, to investigate whether wild type versus Akita mice, which is type 1 diabetes mice, uh, whether the blood flow are different. Uh, this is one example where you have blood flow you know, of wild type and Akita mice, and both retinal and core blood flow decreases. Uh, this paper is submitted. Um, and we also did two different time points where uh, the blue one is the wild type and the white one is the keto mice. Uh, you can see here that uh, both, at both time points, actually, um, at three, two and a half months and 7.5 months uh, up, uh, of age, blood flow of the choroid decreased and in the retina decreased, but not significant here. So two and a half months is very early stage of diabetes in this animal model, um, very early stage of diabetic retinopathy in this model. Seven and a half months is somewhere in the middle, and typically people start up to a year as, as considered to be end stage where you, where you have significant degeneration. So it could potentially be an uh, uh, early marker, bioimaging marker. Uh, that remains to be seen, so we're going to be doing more time point uh, in the future. Um, you can also correlate with function in the same animal. 
Um, the way you do functional uh, evaluation in a rat, uh, you have very limited choice. Unlike human, we can ask them questions. Uh, in rat, you just put a um, or mice, uh, you put an animal in a chamber where you have a uh, screen where actually the spatial frequency um, of this as well as the um, brightness of it, uh, the luminance, you can change that and you can change the contrast. And if the, if, the, if the animal sees it, the animal will actually rotate and try to follow that, 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 uh, um, that uh, virtual motion, if you will. And uh, up to a point, if you have the contrast so low that the animal can't see it, then the animal don't move, just stay in one place. So by finding that threshold, uh, either the frequency threshold, the spatial frequency threshold, or the contrast threshold between the bright and the dark band, uh, you can actually assess function. It's pretty standard in, in, in the field. For, um, so the same group of animals, um, you can see that um, there is a statistical difference, especially in the uh, higher, uh, the older animal, um, in terms of uh, uh, frequency threshold, whereas in the early stage or the last of it, um, same here. They're much different in the th contrast threshold, uh, whereas there's not much change in, so in the early stage. So potentially, uh, that, that blood flow might be um, maybe an early marker similar to a functional mapping. Uh, in, in terms of function, you can actually have, have a, um, correct the measure, right? You can compensate for the lack of, uh, of a drop in function. So before the function, uh, this, the function shows up, you know, you can compensate for quite a while before you can actually see. Whereas blood flow, you're, you're more objective. So you can actually measure blood flow changes and potentially an earlier marker. We still don't know for sure. Another disease is the glaucoma. Um, glaucoma is, I mentioned before, is a, 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 one dominant form of it is due to an increase in intraocular pressure. Um, and the cause is still relatively unknown. Uh, but basically, the drainage is clogged up in your eye. And one of the treatments, uh, actually probably the only, one of the very few treatments is basically give injection um, or to unclog, uh, to unclog the drainage of the, the aqueous fluid from your eye. Um, so as, you, as, the, as the glaucoma progress, you lose proliferations. And eventually, you don't see much anymore. Uh, there is an animal model where it's, it's called DBA2J, um, and what you what in this model uh, show is that uh, intraocular pressure progressively increase in this animal. This genetic model, by the way, um, where in the early stage the this is the profile of the intraocular pressure, which is around um, 14, 15, and that's actually very quite similar to human. Is that that is normal? If your intraocular pressure reaching 20 something. Uh, you are probably in trouble. Um, so um, the histology of it is, is that there are axonal loss at the end. Um, so this is a normal. And at the late stage, uh, 8 to 10 months, you can see that the axon in the optic nerve um, pretty much degenerates. So this is a section of the optic nerve. Um, so we did three time points, uh, four months, six months, and nine months. And nine months is considered to be the terminal, or there are successive uh, uh, changes in uh, or degeneration of the axon, whereas four months uh, is considered to be a very early stage. Um, those are the ends. Um, there's an age-dependent effect, so you can imagine that four months blood flow in the normal. This is normal. Uh, C57 is normal. There is a decrease in blood flow, choroid blood flow in this case, in this graph. And you can see it's a decrease in blood flow with age. But uh, the DBA mice is the glaucoma mice, and they decrease a lot faster. And there's disgusting difference at every stage. Uh, this paper just came out. Um, renal blood flow, uh, same thing, except that we don't have significant until the end stage. And the reason, there are many reasons why it could be so, one of which could be sensitivity. We're much more sensitive to the choroid blood flow because the blood flow is very high. It's 10 times or 10 mil per gram per minute. In fact, the choroid blood flow is about 10 times that of cerebral blood flow, and retinal blood flow are very similar to the brain blood flow. Um, let's skip that one. So in summary, um, I believe that MRI offer depth-resolved layer-specific anatomical layers 
uh, quantitative retinal and quarter blood flow, and I didn't show any bold response, but you saw some of the bold response with respect to gas challenge, but I didn't show any on the visual stimulation. Uh, in the rat retina, cat, mice, uh, we can do all those easily. Um, we can quantify histological thickness. I didn't show you that. Uh, validated by histology, uh, basal blood flow, and validated by microsphere. Um, and I show some example of diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, and retinal degeneration. So with the remaining five minutes, six minutes or so, I want to show what we have been doing with respect to how to get some of these techniques or some of this methodology to human. Um, a typical MRI you saw uh, throughout the day is on the order of one to three millimeter resolution. This is a typical uh, image of the eye. Um, you can see the retina here in the sclera, bulb appear dark, and this is the vitreous anterior chamber lens. Okay. Uh, one of the problems we face it with, face with uh, in imaging the eye using MRI is uh, saccade and eye motion. In the animal, you can anesthetize it, paralyze it, and even that, there will be some drift, and we can correct that very easily. But in human, um, we prefer not to do that, so there, there's a protocol we actually have the person uh, fixate and blink in a, at a Q interval. So we typically blink about five every five seconds. So if you're around that, you're okay. So if you blink regularly and you can go back to the fixation point, then you have no motion artifact throughout your scan. So and this is some of the uh, typical trials we get. And in this particular case, we do it outside a magnet where you have an eye tracker. Uh, you can see that every time you blink, there's a big deflection, okay? And in between, you're pretty stable. This is a zoom in without the, uh, the blink. And you can see that they're on the order of 50 to 100 micron deviations, and this is um, we have actually been doing a lot better than that, but this data set uh, is that we have about 80 microns in the left and right direction and 130 microns in the up and down directions. And you can imagine that's the case because it, when you blink, your eye actually rotates a little bit. So you have, you're much more stable in the left and right than the up and down. So the bottom line is that we can get on the order of 100 microns or so. Uh, as I mentioned before, we can actually get a little better. Uh, with recent investment where the holder's stable, more stable, and other things that we uh, implemented. But we make a small coil. Um, typically, as if you do an MRI, your coil is put your heads over on, on the body for the spine and the heart. But this one, uh, because we're injuring the eye, so we put, uh, make a small coil. And that's basically placed over here. And you can see reasonable high resolution. Uh, 100 micron by 200 micron. And where the person's blink, uh, this image think about 30 seconds or so, uh, maybe a minute, uh, depending on the resolution and the signal noise. Um, so uh, it's feasible to do an anatomical, but that's nothing to fuss about because the OCT does a lot better. So we compare the OCT just to see how the thickness compare. Uh, we have a lot more partial volume effects, as you can imagine, uh, because the resolution is low compared to OCT. OCT, you can, you can reasonably identify the major, major layers. And the choroid is a little harder to do because the RPE block most of the lights. Uh, but nonetheless, with this uh, special OCT, some of special OCT, where using a longer wavelength, the standard one are actually much shorter wavelength, and you can't see this deep. You can't see as deep. But nonetheless, the overall uh, thickness is reasonable. We overestimate the thickness by a little bit. Um, this might be, as I mentioned, because the partial volume effect is the snap error. Uh, this is the optic nerve head um, and temporal and nasal on either side, okay? Um, you can do both respond to an oxygen challenge. So you have a subject in a magnet inhale oxygen, okay? And there are three inhalation of oxygen. Um, if, you can no if you notice, there's actually a two-layer response, the top layer and the bottom layer, okay? And the vascular, which is in between, should have very little respond. So you can see the layer a little bit, uh, which is very surprising. Uh, we're, we're actually very happy that we see it, not surprising, it's expected. You can see a little dentation here also. Some are better than the others, depending on how your sections the slide. Um, so we're very happy that we can ge get a very nice uh, up and down response, as you expect in the brain. Uh, the resolution here is 200 by 400 microns. Um, you can also do the same thing with blood flow. You can see the core blood flow is very strong, uh, 10 times that of the brain. The retinal blood flow is right here. It's, I'm not sure you can see it well, but there is a uh, retinal blood flow right there. Uh, very, very uh, 
low in intensity compared to the choroid, and then there's not much blood flow in, the, in between. That's the vascular region. You can see low indentation here in the optic nerve head. Um, you can, if you pull a profile across here, like from back to front, uh, sclera here, and you go across to the vitreous, you can see two bumps. The choroid is very high blood flow and the retinal low blood flow. So that's where we are. You can also do challenges. You can have a person inhale CO2, 5% uh, CO2 in the air. Uh, blood flow increase as expected, nothing to fuss about. Uh, but the fact that the uh, uh, demonstrative principle, that's nice. Um, you can also do a very interesting task where, where we're trying to find a way to perturb blood flow in the eye. The, temp the simple task is a hand grip. You're literally gripped onto something and hold on it for one to three minutes. And your blood flow in your brain and increase a little bit, very little, because all regularly kicks in and it returns back to normal. So you immediately squeeze, the blood flow jumps up, and it back to normal immediately. In the eye, the all regulation is not as good, um, so you actually do see the all regulations. Uh, you actually see a respond to a hand grip task. So relax, grip, relax for every minute or so. So that was pretty exciting. We measure all the parameters, such as mean arterial blood pressure. So if you do the task, your MAP goes up, IOP goes up, but not significantly. Uh, OOP, OPP goes up, heart rate goes up, uh, et cetera. So I will stop there. And we also, um, we also did uh, a small set of patients that has retinal degeneration. We found that the, the total blood flow in the retina decreased. And that was, this is my last slide. Um, MRI, again, offer depth resolve, and we've been able to move some of the protocol that we have in the animal models to human. Uh, the challenge is the fixation as well as the hardware, which is, you know, you don't have strong gradient as you have in the animal scanners. So, but nonetheless, we were able to get to approximately 200, 100 micron resolution on that order of magnitude. And I show you some uh, challenge to respond to hyperoxia, hypercapnia, uh, and hand grip, uh, et cetera. Whether this goes to clinical is a long way. So um, I like stop there. Chris Pang did uh, many of the work on human um, work and Ian um, animal work, and I would like to thank my the funding agencies that uh, support this. I'll stop there. Thank you. Tim, thank you for this interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering from a comment made by somebody else here related to um, changes in iron content in mm -hmm. light and dark. Mm -hmm. Have you actually, um, you studying animals in the light and dark, I don't know how easy that would be to do with a human because it would be tough, tough to fixate on something in the dark, right. but, right. but um, you know, you're bright, you'll figure some way to do it. And uh, I'm wondering, have you tried something like SWI with high resolution on your, on your animal models in light and dark? This would be mm. fascinating if you could demonstrate changes in iron content um, with that. And, and the other, maybe you can comment on it in a second. The other concept to remember that uh, you know, with SWI, you don't just see you know, regular iron, you see the deoxyhemoglobin also. Mm -hmm. But what mm -hmm. we have seen, again, in the basal ganglia is a high iron content that doesn't change when we do a bold experiment, which means somehow that high iron content is directly linked to high capillary density. So I'm, I'm curious if you've looked at anything there or what, what you might do. We have not, but I'm glad you mentioned that because there is a lot of disease in the retina as well that has accumulated ion. So I would love to come back and chat with you in more detail how to do best because you're the expert on it. And the same thing with the angiography that, that I, I would love your comments on how to improve uh, we have tried a lot, very hard, to do the same thing in humans that we did in the rat that you saw, where you can see capillary, choroid capillaris level resolution. Like the, the size of the vessel is on the order of 50 microns or less, I think. Uh, we're seeing that, but we can't get to human yet. So, anyway. Yeah. Beautiful data. And the, um, I maybe think there's uh, literature uh, indicating that as uh, an extension of the nervous system, the retina. Um, <clears throat> 
shows uh, amyloid deposition uh, in Alzheimer's, uh, like uh, like the rest of the brain, uh, right. Right. and that uh, techniques like this uh, might have the potential to uh, detect things like amyloid angiopathy. Is that something that you've uh, explored or thought about exploring? We have not, but I, I love the comments, so maybe we'll go back to, to do it, because you know, APPB mice are around, and we can just yeah. image I mean, these, these retinas yeah. are so accessible, and the data right, you're getting right. are so beautiful, I think it would yeah. be a great, uh, yes. great and, and Diane and Marianne, I think, will touch on that uh, using optics, I believe. I'm not quite sure, but yeah, uh, they're, you're right. Is that very accessible? So yes. Uh, that was great. I loved your images. Actually, I just had a couple of questions, particularly with the uh, glaucoma um, mm -hmm. mice. One of the things um, way back in the day when I was measuring the retinal vein and artery pressures, um, we were actually on the retina side. But with the mice that you have, they actually have um, elevated IOP with glaucoma. One of the things that might be really interesting is actually to go and make a model where you actually raise the IOP and actually now use bold to actually yes. see the perfusion changes because at some point you're going to get a cutoff where the retina That's stops right. Absolutely. and the choroid takes over. Because we also did um, uh, pressure measurements, or sorry, uh, oxygen tension measurements through the retina. And it's really amazing because everyone always said, oh, it's like you got this double blood supply. You have to because of fixed law, like there's Absolutely. no alternative way around it. Absolutely. So it would be really interesting to see with bold, non-invasively, like if we yes. can actually get a target oxygen saturation because now you can actually change the entire field of glaucoma because right. you have the potential to now say this is what your IOP needs to be to uh, feed your retina. Thank you for the comment. The, the eye field is very interesting measuring blood flow quantitatively in the choroid and in the retina. So we, we're trying to put something to elevate the, the, the saline and in, with something in, in the eye and elevate the pressure systematically and it'd be done in the magnets. Not trivial, but we're trying to do that currently. So yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I have a question about the MR. Yes. Is, is, you said 11.7T. Yes. Is it orthogonal? Control. This horizontal, uh, nine centimeter diameter gradient, okay. uh, pretty, I think there are at least a dozen of them in the world now. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could get, I mean, this, you have a strange coordinate system here. You have a spherical thing, mm -hmm. and you've got a digital control that's mm -hmm. basically orthogonal, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could, like, tweak the, the, um, Animal upside RF. down? No, no, tweak oh. the RF so that, oh. so that, so that, you know, you're, you're getting, like, an analog, um, warping of the, of the signals. Hmm. to sort of match what you're trying to image. Oh, I see, I see. So is there a way to have a better design because of the curvature of the retina, is right, that what you're saying? Right, right. Oh, right. Someone had mentioned that to me like five, ten years ago. I never figured it out. So maybe you and I can talk a little more detail. There is a way to design a gradient and an RF pulse so that you can excite a linear curvature uh, sphere, right. if you will, and that might improve the resolution dramatically. You don't have to go through multi-slides and stuff. Right, because the you know, yeah, parabolic absolutely. thing would match. Absolutely. So I would love to, to be able to design an RF pulse and a gradient pulse to do that. So thank you. No questions? So I'll have the pleasure to introduce the next speaker, and Dr. Marian Simpa, Simka. I need no introduction. He will be the incoming presence for the uh, next for next year. So, And his talk will be on retinal abnormality in multiple sclerosis patients with associated chronic spinal venous insufficiency. So. so, welcome everybody again. Uh, this uh, paper uh, was to be presented by Dr. Adam Cikludiga. Unfortunately, she was unable to, to come here to Orlando, so I presented. He has a disclosure of the main author and he, his minds. Uh, so, uh, CCSVI, as we understand this, this condition at the moment, is a syndrome w which is comprised of stenosis in the jugular and uh, azygous veins, which is characterized by collateral venous outflows and uh, reduced cerebral blood flow. Uh, it should be underlined that uh, CCSVI is a clinical entity which is distinct from multiple sclerosis, that the majority of uh, multiple sclerosis patients, but of course not all of them, present with these venous uh, abnormalities. And also that these vascular lesions can also be found in normal multiple sclerosis individuals. And therefore, the meaning of these uh, vascular abnormalities remains uh, remain to be elucidated. 
and which is also an important uh, causative role for uh, these venous lesions in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis remains to be established. Uh, of course, there are some data which are backing this idea, but sound uh, scientific evidence is still lacking. And what is uh, known at, at the moment? Uh, there is one paper uh, published uh, until now which has shown some uh, anatomical correlation between uh, uh, venous lesions and uh, clinical characteristics of multiple sclerosis. This is a paper published by uh, Zamboni's team, uh, and they found uh, that patient presenting with so-called type D, which uh, means that the lesions are found mostly in the zygos uh, territory, uh, was associated with uh, much higher prevalence of a primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Unfortunately, these findings were not confirmed uh, by others, uh, including our team and also uh, uh, American study, which is uh, presented in, in the poster section. You can look at, the, at the, one of these posters. Uh, the main problem uh, related to um, finding an uh, anatomical link between multiple sclerosis characteristics and vascular char characteristics is that, uh, at least theoretically, lateralization of outflow abnormalities in the jugular veins um, should not result in different localization of the plaques or other, other uh, neurological um, pathologies because uh, main intracranial veins are not uh, right and the left ones, but they are centrally located, they are single vessels. But there is one exception. Uh, ocular lesions may theoretically exhibit uh, this lateralization because every eye is drained by one ophthalmic veins and, and consequently the further by one internal jaguar vein. Which is also very interesting, it is known from previous research that optic neuritis, this clinical, uh, uh, clinical sign of uh, some problem in a multiple sclerosis, preferentially affect left eye. Of course, this difference is not very big, but it is published in the literature, and, then, and this left uh, preference uh, is very hard to, to be explained within the autoimmune paradigm. And, which is also uh, important, it is now known that the CCSVI lesions are more commonly found uh, in the left internal jugular veins uh, if compared with the right side. So, uh, in uh, our study, we used to use optical coherence tomography to uh, assess uh, retinas of multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, optical coherence uh, tomography is a very, very nice diagnostic tool and, and, and it gives in, in vivo uh, something like histology of the eye. So, you can look at the layers of the retina, uh, thickness and, and so on. Uh, in general, uh, after this examination, uh, you get something like that. On the left side, you can see uh, healthy retina. On the right side, disease. And on the right side, there's a patient with multiple sclerosis after optic neuritis, and you can see the striking difference. So even the patient enjoyed this, this, uh, this graphs. In our uh, study, we looked at the data of over 200 multiple sclerosis patients, so in total over 400 eyes were examined, uh, and we looked at uh, the following uh, OCT parameters, as average ganglion cell complex, focal loss volume, global loss volume, and retinal nerve fiber layer. And in the same patient, we looked at the venographic characteristics of vascular abnormality. We, uh, we performed a catheter venography, and we used uh, four-grade uh, scale of this venous abnormalities at, uh, according to our previously published uh, scale. The scale is one, grade one, two, 
stay at most severe uh, grade 4. So we found that that ocular pathology was quite common. Of course, which should have been expected, uh, pathologic findings were found more commonly in the patient with positive history of optic neuritis, but also you can, you can see on the uh, uh, right graph, also in the patient with negative history of uh, optic neuritis, but it is known that uh, uh, retina in multiple sclerosis patient very commonly exhibits uh, pathology even if this history of uh, optic neuritis is negative. Also we found newly uh, linear correlation between general status of this patient uh, revealed by means of EDSS score and uh, prevalence of abnormal uh, ocular findings, which uh, tell us uh, that uh, actually uh, this retinal abnormalities are a reflection of global cerebral uh, neural uh, degeneration probably. But what uh, what about uh, potential link between uh, retinal pathology and the vascular one? So we found, interestingly, that a uh, patient with blockage only on the one side presented with much higher per, uh, abnormality in, in the eyes. So we found that this statistically significant higher prevalence of abnormal OCT parameters uh, in terms of uh, four, uh, three uh, OCT parameters assessed and trend towards such an increased frequency also in, uh, in the case of the uh, remaining fourth uh, parameter. Also, which was very interesting, we found that there's this abnormal uh, OCT uh, values uh, were primary find uh, only in a patient with severe blockage. On the contrary, a uh, patient with uh, bilateral occlusion of internal jugal veins, uh, as well as those who were presenting with uh, pathology uh, in the azygos territory, and also this patient who were not found a venous abnormality at, at all, they, they were found nearly the same prevalence of retinal pathology. So you can see in these graphs, Uh, correlation between number of affected veins. So in general we found that uh, this asymmetric and severe occlusion was associated with, with higher prevalence of retinal pathology. So uh, the results of uh, this study um, tells us that most likely there is a, a, a link between uh, vascular and, and uh, neurologic pathology, uh, also in terms of anatomy. So uh, this, this thing uh, which neurologi uh, neurologists um, call on, uh, us to, 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 to show that there is uh, some, some association, association and at least in terms of eyes such an association, association can be uh, revealed. Thank you very much. It's hard to get neurologists excited about this because they say, well, of course, if you have optic neuritis, you'll see retinal pathology. That doesn't really make sense, does it? Yes, but, but you know, the uh, interesting thing is that, that we see a higher prevalence of this pathology on the side of vascular pathology, and which is interesting, we did not expect it, that, uh, that this, this higher prevalence is seen in the patient with blockage on the one side. Would you expect retinal pathology from optic neuritis, from demyelination of the optic nerve? Uh, not necessary, because it was also uh, found in the patient with negative history of optic neuritis. Yeah, I, I will have uh, many, many questions about this.
May I have a question for you? The first one is this. Uh, what you found is uh, really what we found, because uh, we have a prevalence of uh, unilateral optic uh, neuritis in, in patients with uh, unilateral jugular involvement. This is what we publish in journal Neurology and Science of Society. The second thing is this. What about the primary progressive form? Well, the best way to do in a, in a neurological field is to, to assess every single form and to say this, is, this belongs to relapsing remitting, secular progressive and primary progressive. Uh, in my opinion, the, the primary progressive form are really have a few problems in vision. Really few problem. If you look at the, the fundus, in this patient you found the fundus pretty normal. And they usually they haven't optic neuritis in the field. The second, we have to keep in mind also that the eye is the, the windows for, uh, for the brain. So we, we found uh, in our patient uh, a lot of uh, retinal peripheralitis. And uh, the, typically in MS uh, there is a, a a syndrome called uh, pasplonitis. I would like your opinion about this. Uh, yes, but, but this examination looks for, for different things. It doesn't look uh, at the ves blood vessels uh, in the eye, but it looks uh, at, uh, at the nervous cells and nervous fibers, and thickness and, and the characteristics of, of this nervous tissue, you know, these neurons uh, actually in the eyes. So. Uh, you know this, this uh, uh, common uh, ophthalmological examination uh, for this fundoscopy is similar to OCT, but it's not the same. The, those two examinations look for two different things, similar but, but not, not the same. So just to close the loop on this unilaterally, you had 240 patients, could you? But you didn't give us any left-right. Uh, I'm just sort of curious about what you found on the. OCT findings, more common left? Yes, 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 yes. How? Yes, but, but also if you look into the details of the, this characteristic, uh, characteristic, it was not only left-right, but, but uh, if it was close uh, correlation between localization of this unilateral occlusion yes, and, 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 the, and the retinal pathology. So also in this patient with, of course there's a minority, but with patient who presented with occlusion on, on the right interangiogal veins, also these patients were much more likely to present with these problems in the eyes. Ross? Oh, that was great. Actually, um, it was quite interesting um, what you presented because we've actually always kind of wondered why is it asymmetric. And, and again, basically you're showing something that we saw 20 years ago where it actually has to do with hyperperfusion. Again, it's showing the fact that you actually have the artery coming in at high pressure, vein typically going out and expected to be equal to intraocular pressure, but now we're actually demonstrating, as you've shown, that if that venous pressure is slightly elevated, you're getting hyperperfusion, you're getting the retinal losses that you expect. So it's actually tying all of this together with the whole CCSVI, that it's actually venous hypertension, which has sort of been the overriding theme. So I think we're gonna see a lot more of what you're showing. Uh, so let me introduce the next speaker, is Dr. Diana Discro, which will further discuss uh, CCSVI ophthalmological issues. I'm Diana Driscoll, and I want to thank everyone at uh, ISNVD for having me. I'm extremely honored and humbled to be here in front of such a prestigious crowd. I wanted to thank also the Harvey Institute for Human Genetics for recognizing my work. Anyone who would love to contact me, I, I mean, I would love it if you'd contact me, at prettyill.com. Um, uh, there's a doctor contact page. I disclose the following financial relationships, none. Most of my 
clinical trials and studies are self-funded. Uh, and one reason is that I am a patient, and I never thought of this as an advantage before, but it really is when we get in some of these strange illnesses that cause some strange symptoms, it's very difficult to tell what is going on unless you're actually experiencing, is what I found. I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a defect in the collagen, and collagen makes up about 80% of our bodies. So we, uh, we start off with one, one uh, challenge already. We have leaky vessels and a, a leaky blood-brain barrier. We've already made that change from collagen 1 to collagen 3 in many parts of our bodies. So we easily go on to develop multiple sclerosis and other conditions. I have autonomic dysfunction, or POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is basically a breakdown of the autonomic nervous system that we see in the majority of Ehlers-Danlos patients. It also hits multiple sclerosis patients, but it's a subclinical presentation. They don't usually realize it unless they are tested. I have mast cell activation syndrome, which is likely secondary to an imbalance in inflammatory cytokines. And um, I'm starting treatment on that, and wow, what a response I'm getting there. So we're going to talk some about that, too. I have CCSVI. Those are my jugs there. And I uh, have been treated. I restenosed in about a week, which was unfortunate. But I believe I know why, and I'd like to share that with you, too. I have one brain lesion with starting to develop symptoms of multiple sclerosis. I'm a therapeutic optometrist, so my background is eyes. And I thought the eyes really are the window to systemic health. And that opened the door for me to do continued research. So I wanted to start with, um, first as a review, Ehlers-Danlos POTS patients go on to develop other autoimmune conditions such as systemic lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. Um, and when I mentioned MS patients develop POTS, that was discovered in 2010 by Dr. Grubb and his team. Uh, my first clinical trial that I looked closer at the eye, and it's out at poster 154, is the vascular fundus changes with patients with high probability of chronic cerebral spinal um, insufficiency, penis insufficiency. And indeed, I, it was a small sample. I looked at 60 affected eyes and 60 age-matched normals and was trying to see if I could tell the difference. Because I thought it would be great to be able to go to your eye doctor and have the eye doctor say, you know, it just looks a little bit like you may have CCSVI. I thought that would be magnificent. Well, it takes a great deal of magnification to do so. But with some magnification, we can see that, okay, here is two eyes, and much like Dr. Simka said in his study also, one eye was generally much more affected than the other, and it was on the side with the greater stenosis. So on your right, I believe it is, you can see the enlarged vein here, hinting at poor venous drainage, and the arteries here. We saw an abnormal artery to vein ratio. The arteries were too small, the veins were too large. And on this um, other eye of the same patient, these arteries are ridiculously small, which may have something to do with endothelin 1, still looking into that. But we also saw a lot of atherosclerosis, even in the very young patients. And as we know, multiple sclerosis patients, Ehlers-Danlos patients also, develop abnormal lipid profiles. And um, that is after we're triggered, after we kind of get going. So um, this is my image. And you can see, I hope you can see this, but on my right side, this vein here is not only enlarged, it's what we call beaded. And the arteries are too small, and they're atherosclerotic, which is really discouraging, I'll tell you. On the other eye, the vein was much smoother, but you can see the artery, again, is way too small, an abnormal um, AV ratio. And then I ran a clinical trial because, and again, this is where it takes being a patient and kind of having children involved and being in the trenches with the patients really helped me out because so many symptoms that patients were describing to me and that I was living with sounded like hydrocephalus. And then I would look at children who had problems since birth and then kind of looked at my children and thought, well, they had a couple symptoms too. Did a retrospective analysis on, on children who have, or adults who have, Ehlers-Danlos and POTS, looked back at their first 15 months of life, and indeed found that we were born with hydrocephalus. It looks like it's the external communicating 
form of hydrocephalus, which is oftentimes misdiagnosed. But when we were treated with that, we got a lot of relief. Many multiple sclerosis patients also have hydrocephalus in the literature. Now, I knew we wanted to increase oxygen perfusion. I oftentimes felt like I was, I was suffocating, and many of us did. And poster 147, I think, is a good um, summary of this. We know that the cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. My apologies to Dr. Raj, because that is as much engineering as I know. But to decrease the intracranial pressure, I did what most eye doctors do, and that is I grabbed that old expired bottle of Diamox in the back of the cabinet that we all have, but we very rarely need to, to treat emergency glaucoma patients. And I downed a couple of those, got immediate overnight relief, which was amazing to me, due to likely, I assume, the decreased protection of cerebral spinal fluid. But it also has a couple other mechanisms. One, it removes fluid from the interstitial space in the brain, which is likely one reason it's effective in altitude sickness. But I didn't realize I was as brilliant as I was until Dr. Hagee said it was brilliant, because he participated in a study not that long ago that showed, that measured an increase of almost 40% of oxygen and perfusion in the brain of patients taking acetazolamide. So I thought we were on to something. Of course, we can decrease intracranial pressure, hopefully with angioplasty. And then comes in the question about the transverse sinus, and a lot of us have this stenosis transverse sinus, and that perhaps could be a cause of, of um, hydrocephalus, but there's, there's conflicting studies out there. The study, or the, the MRI there on the right, is a patient with Ehlers-Danlos who has external communicating hydrocephalus. And one reason this is so underdiagnosed is somehow physicians get in their minds that we need to see papilledema or swelling of the optic nerve head, or at least enlarged ventricles, to have hydrocephalus, neither of which is the case in external communicating hydrocephalus. We have increased fluid pressure in the subarachnoid space, mainly above the brain here, there we go. Above the brain, you can see that extra fluid. And we'll see that down the spinal canal also. Uh, I'm presuming it's because our arachnoid villi are not working properly and we're not able to drain into the superior sagittal sinus and out through the transverse sinus. That is pure conjecture at this point. Now, mast cells I knew became involved, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but I wanted to introduce it at least, because mast cells release over 60 very powerful chemicals. They're supposed to help us heal, which they can when they're in balance, but they can get way overbalanced because when they spit out their histamine and other inflammatory cytokines, they actually recruit T cells and astrocytes to also spit out inflammatory cytokines. And they are kind of the, the Ponzi schemers, if you will, the inflammation cascade. They make it amplify tremendously. Now what histamine or anesthesia, for the anesthesiologists here, or inflammation can do is it compromises the blood-brain barrier, which is made of astrocytes, of course. Now if you can imagine the compromise in blood-brain barrier puts fluid in the interstitial space, causes vasogenic cerebral edema, an increase in intracranial pressure, a collapse in brain capillaries, an arrest of cerebral perfusion, and then damage to the astrocytes, which unfortunately lead us back, leads us back to further compromise of that blood-brain barrier. That's a very vicious cycle. It will also cause damage to the oligodendrocytes and myelin. And I knew we needed to break that cycle. Did so immediately with mast cell medications, H1 and H2 antagonists, mast cell stabilizers, and we were greatly improved, but there is still more to it. And I had to mention this because uh, I found this way cool picture, and everybody asked me about optic neuritis and glaucoma. Um, this, if my cursor work, okay, this is the duramater here up at the top. This bottom part is the optic nerve. This canal here, it looks like a river, is where the cerebral spinal fluid is. You can imagine if there's a drastic increase in inflammatory cytokines or an increase in pressure or just garbage, if you will, getting in there, that it can damage the structure there in the middle, that big dark structure, there we go, the arachnoid villi. And that is usually what takes out that extra cerebral spinal fluid down into these canals and then drains out through the venules of the eye and out she goes. So if we can fix what is wrong with the brain, we can fix what is wrong with the optic nerve. I really believe that. The optic nerve is the only cranial nerve 
that is considered to be a direct extension of the brain. It comes right out of the lateral geniculate nucleus, the only one that does so. And the studies out of Vanderbilt indicate that glaucoma looks like it is originating up at that connection with the lateral geniculate nucleus and working its way down from the brain instead of vice versa, where we always thought the pressure inside the, the eye was causing the damage and working its way up. Now we're kind of re-looking at that. A balance, I think, is everything. Um, I do believe uh, CCSVI is congenital because I could see symptoms in myself, my children, other patients that hinted at it, but we were able to overcome it. Rose above until we were triggered, and holy cow, I was triggered with a virus, it put me in bed for three years. This was not subtle. My son was also treated with a virus. Hydrocephalus is also a trigger for this. Um, hydrocephalus fills out an increased number of inflammatory cytokines. That's not good. Extreme stress, positive or negative, and as you know, an accident, say a car accident. I feel people triggered by that also. That is where the inflammatory cascade begins and the mast cells uh, amplify it. So if this trigger is chronic, for example, if the stimulus is still present or if the blood-brain barrier is still leaky, you can imagine that the inflammatory cytokines in the cascade continues. Now how do we know that inflammatory cytokines are a big part of this picture? I really wanted to know that. Um, poster 158, please feel free to take a look. I learned that in Ehlers-Danlos, we developed left ventricular diastolic dysfunction, which at first was of intellectual curiosity until I developed it, and then all of a sudden I was highly motivated to figure this out. Well, I did a little research and discovered that multiple sclerosis patients also develop a subclinical level of left ventricular diastolic dysfunction. They don't usually know that. We don't think we diagnose a multiple sclerosis patient and say, oh, better go run get that echo. So, uh, but somebody else figured that out. So what I wanted to do was look closer and see what is happening on a cellular basis, what is happening on a chemical basis to cause this change in tissue, no matter what the overlying cause was, if you will. I learned that an increase in myocardial stress, you know, like fluid stress on the tissue, if you can imagine, plus endothelin-1, which deserves a whole hour by itself, plus the matrix metalloproteinases, if you add to that the increase in inflammatory cytokines, especially tumor necrosis alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, those are the biggies, will cause collagen degradation and ventricular remodeling. And that sounded just a little bit like CCSVI to me. Now, inflammatory cytokines are bad, bad dudes. Um, and think in terms of this with either making a valve go bad or restenosis. Because they cause fibrosis, inflammation, endothelial cell apoptosis, thromboembolism, we worked so hard to avoid that after uh, angioplasty, an upregulation of cell adhesion mo molecules, et cetera. That is bad. Now, and then, of course, the mast cells get in there and amplify it. We call that the mediator release syndrome. Uh, one thing that also hints toward multiple sclerosis being a little bit different as far as inflammatory cytokines is that multiple sclerosis patients are very prone to anterior granulomatous uveitis and pars planitis. About the only other conditions we see that in is a sarcoid. And pars planitis is what we consider an intermediate uveitis. That's inflammation in the middle part of the brain. And I always wondered when I saw this, in the middle part of the brain, why the middle? What was so special about that? Well, it is special. Um, and I learned that the mast cells love the choroid. And uh, the choroid is this pink area here in this blow up of the eye, if I can get the cursor to work here. And it's not working. But it goes all the way around the inside of the eye. It's covered up by the retina up until you get to the pars plana. Can you see that little window there? There it is. And that is considered kind of like a escape hatch for mast cells, their mediators, and inflammatory cytokines to go into that middle part of the eye. And indeed, we can measure tryptase in the vitreous of these patients. The only cell in the body that will produce tryptase is a mast cell, not the cells they recruit. They won't spit out tryptase. So if we see tryptase, we know mast cells. Now these cells and the cells they recruit, the T cells, the neutrophils, et cetera, will actually pile up against the edge of the retina and what we call snow banking. So it is not subtle. It is not subtle at all. 
Now, I'm trying to step back and look at all these conditions, the family, if you will, that may be um, related to CCSVI. And I, I can't help but drift toward multiple, multiple sclerosis. When Ehlers-Danlos and Potts, we develop chronic candida, as do multiple sclerosis patients. That is a signal of a lower immune system. It is oftentimes the first sign of AIDS in an AIDS patient. Now, and that picture on the left is esophageal candida. Okay. Um, it, also, our HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis, just goes nuts. Uh, we call it endocrinology gone wild in Ehlers-Danlos. I had an endocrinologist say that my panels were basically impossible. So it, it, it goes nuts. So what I did is I looked at 23 symptoms that I had, because it's all about me, and tried to see what these other conditions had in, had in common with Ehlers-Danlos and POTS. And I pulled out nine of them to show you today, because this is where it starts to get interesting. So heads up. What do all of these have in common, all the following, gastroparesis and IBS, dysphagia, difficulty with speech, sleep disorders, GERD, low gallbladder ejection fractions, liver enzymes are off, bradycardia, tachycardia palpitations, insulin resistance, a decrease in immune system as we talked about, an increase in inflammation, drastic increase, and the HPA axis going wild. One thing can control all of those. Any ideas? Okay, I have to give you hints here. Um, does that give you any ideas? <laughs> Just kidding. Love PowerPoint. Okay, that's my internal jugular vein. And now, thanks to Dr. Hakey, is a slice from my fMRI. The blue arrow points to the internal jugular vein. The red arrow points to the slightly more normal side. That's big. Okay, that's too big. That's a big honking one is what that is. Now, the yellow arrows point to the internal carotid artery. There is a nerve that is ensheathed in the carotid sheath with those two structures that is involved. Here's a drawing to kind of make it clear. You can see the IJV here. And now imagine it getting very large and slightly increased pressure. There's the internal carotid artery, which the pressure is much higher. It's going to push right back, right? What is going to take the hit? is the vagus nerve. And again, they're in sheath together in the carotid sheath. So vagus nerve compression. Whoa. Um, here's a beautiful sonogram showing the um, common carotid artery in the IJV. The white arrow points to the uh, vagus nerve. That really got me thinking. Um, the vagus nerve, as you know, is the parasympathetic nervous system pathway, basically. It's a cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. So when that is not functioning well, we get more inflammation. We get more inflammatory cytokines. It's mainly afferent fibers. So uh, it, it communicates with the organs to the brain both ways, but definitely from the organs to the brain, it tells the brain the state of the organs, and that can communicate back. If that communication is lost, we can lose quite a bit of proper organ function. Now, there's an, it's also considered to be the interface between the brain and the immune system. Now, this I found amazing, because the macrophages, which come in, for example, in MS and help clean up, or what we believe to, to clean up, the um, mess of, of broken myelin, et cetera, well, when they are not under control of the vagus nerve, if that vagus nerve is compressed, all the rules change. The, the macrophages actually release tumor necro necrosis factor, the big daddy inflammatory cytokine. Um, and there is one spot on the macrophages that the vagus nerve controls. It's called the peripheral alpha-7 subunit containing nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay. And that prevents that release of TNF in a normal healthy patient, but not if the vagus nerve is involved. So. This, of course, since the parasymp parasympathetic system, nervous system now is not working as well, the sympathetic nervous system is overriding everything. And what that does is dumps into our bodies all these catecholamines, uh, norepinephrine especially for us, um, epinephrine, and what do those do? They drastically increase inflammation and the output of inflammatory cytokines. Here we go again. And they drain magnesium. I think it's important to know in Ehlers-Danlos patient, all of our cells 
intracellularly are low in magnesium. In multiple sclerosis patients, the erythrocytes are low in magnesium. The vagus nerve also helps control the HPA axis. So imagine if the hypothalamus is not receiving the proper signals, it's kind of garbage in, garbage out, which would explain that. One branch of the vagus nerve also goes to the right recurrent laryngeal nerve, which can explain why so many of us, and MS patients and our other family members, uh, start to lose our voice and we get hoarse voices. And yet some of us can recover that immediately after angioplasty if some of that pressure is removed from the vagus nerve. Now, what does all this mean? I think it's exciting. I think it means a lot. Um, vagus nerve compression, secondary to CCSVI, um, it explains, for example, why angioplasty helps with some of the symptoms immediately, why so many conditions seem to occur in the same patient or in the same family members. If you look at the family tree of patients such as us, we call it the family cactus because you'll see Uncle Joe has MS, Sister Sally has uh, uh, EDS and uh, bipolar and somebody else has RA and somebody else we don't know what they have but we, they've been bed, in, bed in bed for 20 years and there's mental illness, so and so committed suicide, it's a, it's, it's a family cactus for sure. I believe that there are many, many more conditions that are involved with CCSVI than we've ever considered before. I think it's time to take a look at those. Now, um, illnesses that may be caused by CCSVI and vagus nerve compression, a lot of the science has already been done. This is not Dr. Diana saying this. These conditions, scientists have already tested vagus nerve function. It's very easy to do with a tilt table test, a sham eating test if the intestines are involved. Um, an RR, or RR interval test, for example, we, it's, it's fairly easy to test for vagus nerve function. Um, but multiple sclerosis, Ehlers-Danlos POTS, by almost definition, POTS is vagus nerve dysfunction. Lyme disease, they have orthostatic intolerance. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, chronic fatigue syndrome. They suffer from vagus nerve problems. Fibromyalgia, whatever that means, that was a little bit of a hodgepodge there, but I believe there, a lot of them suffer from that. Type 2 diabetes, how huge is this? But again, if you think about, if the communication is lost to the pancreas, that we don't, we're not getting the signal on how much insulin to produce, that's not good. And metabolic syndrome also. And again, metabolic syndrome, it's not just me. Studies have already been done showing that the heart rate variability, the RRIT or the, with the tilt table test, that there's an abnormality of the vagus. Nobody has linked that with CCSVI before. And you know why I think that is? They weren't looking. I think too many neurologists, forgive me for the neurologists who are here, God bless you, but I know my neurologists wouldn't even look at my results. I think had they looked at that and kept an open mind, they would say, you have every symptom a vagus nerve compression, which I did. The vagus nerve con controls every organ between the neck and the lower third of the intestine except for the adrenal gland. And as we get sicker and sicker, our organs show this happening, which is certainly occurring to me. Conditions that may be caused that are not necessarily diseases, but ones which doctors fight with and they just can't fix and they're so frustrated with. IBS and gastroparesis, I think it's very underdiagnosed as a vagus nerve problem. Gallbladder disease, idiopathic liver fibrosis, ileocecal valve dysfunction. The only thing that controls the valve between the small and large intestine is the vagus nerve. By definition, if you have ileocecal valve dysfunction, you have vagus nerve dysfunction. And guess who? was diagnosed with that two weeks ago. I am here against my doctor's best wishes because I, I do have that. Inappropriate sinus, sinus tachycardia syndrome, kind of the dumping ground for most cardiologists, right? Our, our heart rates are too high because the sympathetic system is way overriding this defunct parasympathetic system. But the cardiologists didn't know what to do with that, so they just kind of put us in that lump. Neurocardiogenic syncope, organic brain disease, panic disorders, and chronic anxiety. I do think mental disorders 
definitely are related. I personally went through organic brain disease for two weeks before I started mast cell treatment. Dementia, suicide ideation, uh, bipolar presentation, and I could recognize it, but I couldn't control it. Two weeks later, it was gone. Panic disorders is oftentimes the very first symptom of POTS and ehlers danlos And we also have low-level chronic anxiety from basically birth, which can exhibit as anxiety, OCD, or as overachievement. So, uh, sleep disorders too, and if you can imagine if our sympathetic system is on overdrive and our parasympathetic has stopped, we have trouble. We have weird sleep cycles. And as we get older and that internal carotid artery becomes stiffer with atherosclerosis or what have you, then it's going to push back more onto that, this vagus. Now, what can we do right now? I'd say, one, increase intracranial pressure. That was huge help for so many people. Decrease brain inflammation. Control mast cells. That's easy to do. And, and that stops some of the amplification. There are medications focused on particular inflammatory cytokines, and I myself have started on one, and wow, what a difference. Um, I believe that controlling the inflammatory cytokines may prevent our valves from going bad, and it may prevent restenosis. Um, angioplasty, after the inflammatory cytokines are controlled, is the time to do that, okay? Uh, we want to restore, uh, maintain control of inflammation, and restoring the vagus nerve function is going to help do a lot of that for us. Now, um, if the vein cannot shrink enough after CCSVI angioplasty, then we may need to look at vagus nerve decompression. There's an external one that I really want to look at in Germany, if anybody knows anybody in Germany. It hasn't quite made it to the States yet. Uh, we want to recognize and treat hydrocephalus, even the ones that aren't, are so underdiagnosed. And we want to start testing the vagus nerves and educating physicians. So take home message here, I think, is vagus nerve compression, CCSVI, cytokine imbalance, is causing much more than we ever realized. We're going to change the world with CCSVI one brain cell at a time if we have to. So I thank you so much.